Okay, so my name is Nikki Coleman and I'm a chaplain here in Canberra and I'm also an ethicist who specialises in space ethics. Um, and one of the things that I do is that I go to schools here in Canberra and I talk to the STEM students about ethics and about space. And in the only way that a 14-year-old girl can reduce you to nothing, I had a girl say to me, space ethicist, is that like a real job? <laughs> so I encourage you to have a chat to me afterwards after I've given you this presentation to tell me whether you think I have a real job or not. Okay, so when you think about space ethics, is this the kind of thing that you think of? These are the Star Destroyers from Star Wars, am I right? Yes? No? I didn't get the wrong movie? Fantastic. Or, do you think of Skynet? There are many, 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 many uses of space. Through uh, weapons in space, but also through uh, the satellites that we use in space. Um, and uh, we, there are concerns, obviously, around or, um, autonomous weapons as well. I thought it was really encouraging to hear people talk earlier about having humans at least somewhere in the loop. Oh, go back one. And of course we have Space Force, um, which, as you all know, is the latest um, development to come out of the United States. So the United States uh, have a meeting in about a month, uh, maybe next week or in a month's time, to actually um, brief the, the Vice President about how the plans are going for the creation of Space Force. Um, one of the things that Space Force highlights to us is that there has been an actually an increase in the militarisation of space. Militarisation of space has been around for ages, um, but it's been done quietly, whereas now it's really hard to get away from logos like this. Um, we are now talking more and more about the militarisation of space, um, as we have today. We, as the Air Force, rely very heavily on space security. Um, and if we lose that space security, it not only impacts on our capability um, to deliver air power, but it also dramatically impacts on our community as well. So, <laughs> um, I actually I'll go back because I do want to talk about weapons in space before I get to the UN. So there are three main areas that we have for weapons in space. We have Earth to space weapons, they're usually called ASAT, um, ASAT so anti-satellite um, technology. Um, and it's primarily surface to space or air to space weapons. And we know that the USA, Russia and China have actually developed ASAT uh, weapons. Uh, China actually tested one of these in 2007, they blew up one of their own satellites. Uh, but we do know that other uh, nations also have capabilities in this area. ASAT, ASAT weapons are now limited because of the space debris, as you mentioned earlier, the space debris that they cause. However, the cleaning up, the great technology leaps um, in the removal of space debris actually open up uh, the possibility of um, anti-satellite weapons um, actually developing even further again. And I'll explain a little bit more about that at the moment. So one of the things that our Associate Professor Stephen Coleman, who's here, uh, has written about is that anything that can be used to clean up space debris can be used as an offensive weapon against a working satellite. And we've been saying this for a while, and I'm really glad to see you nodding, because normally when I give this talk, I actually say this and I get these blank faces. So. There are lots of concerns around how um, the new space debris removal technology can be used. And I'll actually talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But one of the concerns that we have um, within the ethics community is, for example, with America creating Space Force, they are taking the protection of their space assets much more seriously and have declared, President Trump has declared only recently this year, that any attack on an American satellite, and he didn't say military satellite, which kind of opens that up quite considerably, any attack on an American satellite is a hostile act of war, which is concerning if there was, an, um, say, an inadvertent accident with space debris removal that actually accidentally hurt a, a satellite and they won't be able, weren't able to prove it. 
So another area of space weapons is space to earth weapons. So when you think of um, the, the big laser death ray in the movies pointing down to the earth, that's the kind of thing that you're thinking of. Now that is um, uh, not overly advertised. There's not a lot of unclassified material that we can actually look at that to research on it or to discuss that openly within the public sphere. But we do know that there have been tests um, and weapons development in that area, particularly with the big um, space uh, countries, superpowers. Um, but they have, for example, there's definitely at least orbital systems um, to look at launching payloads from space down to Earth. And then finally, the third thing is weapons to be utilised in space from satellite to satellite. And some examples include, and this is current research, cannons, lasers, missiles, nets, harpoons, EMPs. So there's a wide range of research currently ongoing looking at um, satellite to satellite or system to system um, <coughs> weapons operating in space. So war and space, um, how we utilise that, whether that's how we utilise cyber systems, utilising satellites, or whether that's war, war from space to Earth, Earth to space, or space to space, is going to happen at some point in the future. So at the same time as we're seeing a dramatic increase in the, um, the, the militarisation of space, um, there's been a massive increase in the commercialisation space at the same time. Put your hand up if you've heard of Elon Musk. He's a great self-promoter. Him and his car. Don't get me started on the car. <laughs> if you want to hear me get on a soapbox later on, ask me about the car. Um, so there has, uh, Elon Musk is one of thousands of new space um, companies. There are thousands of startups. So not only do we have people like um, operations like Elon Musk, who wants to put up swarms of satellites that comprise of 4,000 satellites. That's a lot of satellites that he's wanting to increase. He's not alone, however. There are Indian companies that will want to put up a thousand satellites for communication, for internet and so on. There are not only companies that are putting up huge numbers of satellites, there are now companies that are creating manufacturing in space. So there's a really cool company called Made in Space who are manufacturing things on um, the International Space Station using a 3D printer. There is also companies that are talking about commercial operations to Mars. There are companies that are talking about commercial operations to the moon. There are companies that are talking about asteroid mining. So there has been a dramatic increase in the commercialisation of space at exactly the same time that we're seeing a dramatic increase in the militarisation of space. And it seems, from my perspective, that there is a concern that we're actually starting to lose control over space at exactly the time when we want to actually maintain the most amount of control. Um, one of my concerns is that space is going to be the next Wild West, but it's just going to be everything kind of goes up there. We don't want that to happen. So, the UN will save us. Um, and I have actually done a lot of work with the UN this year. I've actually spent almost two months at the UN working with UNITY, which is the UN Office um, for Research into Disarmament Research. They're actually doing some really interesting stuff on space, looking at PAROS, which is um, the prevention of an arms race in space, pardon me, and also um, looking at anti-satellite testing standards as well. So I kind of feel guilty using them as a bit of a punchline, but um, as a bit of a joke, because it would be great if the UN could operate internationally and actually coordinate all of this and save us. But my experience, not of unity, but of the way the UN works has been quite frustrating this year. <laughs> um, watching the UN as a large body um, of uh, almost 200 nations coming to, to agree on certain things is very, very difficult. So Unity is doing great work, but they actually have their hands tied. So when we look at the Outer Space Weapons Treaty, most people actually assume that that means we can't actually put weapons in space. But that is not actually true. The Outer Space Weapons Treaty only bans the, the placement of weapons of mass destruction. And what that means is, um, there are no kind of norms at the moment around uh, placing weapons in space. 
There are a few uh, treaties here and there, but nothing that's kind of binding. Which is why um, I can't remember who el whoever held up the Warmer Emanuel um, <coughs> brochure, which is actually outside. Grab one as you are leaving. Um, one of the things that's great about the Woomera Manual is that it's actually going to be codifying a lot of that material from very, very many, many disparate areas so that we actually have a much better handle on the legal aspects around war, war in space. But I'm not a lawyer, I'm actually an ethicist. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the ethical situation. So I'd like you to shift gears. Um, part of what I'm talking about today is giving you an overview of space ethics and in particular military space ethics. So when you think about satellites, you often, this is a, oh, it's a shiny thing. Okay, so you often think of, when you think of a satellite, you think of something like this. Can somebody tell me what this is? I'm looking to the cadets, somebody must know. Put your hand up if you know. I don't have chocolate to throw. Normally I throw chocolate in my classes. International Space Station, did you say? Yeah. Yes, it's the International Space Station, currently with the leak. Okay? So when you think of satellites, you think of something this big. Oops, or you think of something this big, which is, and I wrote it down, it's the Blagovest number 11L, which was a Russian communication satellite that was launched last year. But the vast majority of satellites are going to be this size. And that's um, actually Simon Barraclough from University of New South Wales, Canberra Space, um, who I am a part of their department, I should have said at the beginning. Um, so this is a CubeSat, and the, the, the future of um, satellites internationally are going to be these size. The problem is when you put 4,000 of those up from one company, and there's 1,000 companies wanting to do this, um, somebody over here asked the question about what happens um, at the end of the life of a satellite. Um, what do we do then? And my argument is that as an ethicist, I want actually people to be thinking when they launch what their end of life is going to be like. Okay, So that they're not actually having to make decisions in 15 years' time or two or three years' time um, because CubeSats don't necessarily have the longest lifespan like some of our other satellites. Um, we need to be planning for the long term because it's about a sustainable future in space. So the reason that these satellites are available to us, the reason that CubeSats and NanoSats are available is because of a massive decrease in the cost of manufacturing. Um, it is about budgets, as you said previously. However, realistically, it's about the cost of um, producing something like this has dramatically decreased. So instead of putting up one satellite, we can put up, put up 15 satellites. And that bring, bring, builds in some redundancy. If one of them gets hit by space debris, that's okay, we've got another 14. Um, but the dramatic decrease in the cost of um, space operations actually comes at a hidden cost. And that's what I was talking over at, um, in Germany about. So part of the hidden cost is that anybody can put things into space. And that's great because now Australia is able to take control of our own space agency and our own space industry, along with, we're a little bit late to the party, Pakistan in 1961, Thailand in 2002, United Arab Emirates, who are actually forging ahead in what they're doing in space. They're big players in the space industry at the moment, 2014, and New Zealand in 2016. Do we have a New Zealand exchange officer cadet here who can go yay for New Zealand? No? Okay. So part of the problem with a huge number of uh, new players in the space area is actually what was mentioned before, which is space debris. So some of you may have seen this graph before. This is actually the graph of the increase in space debris internationally. Um, you can see there that 2007 Chinese anti-satellite test dramatically increased the amount of space debris that we have right here. And then this was the um, Iridium and Cosmos satellites <laughs> um, crashing against each other. Now this particular graph is um, only things that are 10 centimetres in length, about the size of your fist. There are another 500,000 pieces that are of space debris that can't be tracked currently. And part of the reason that's a problem is it only takes a paint fleck to hit a satellite in the right way to take it, take it out and to make it unusable. 
And these figures are before we've had the 4,000 companies like Elon Musk putting up 4,000 satellites. So the in problem with space debris is actually only going to increase. So this is a really interesting representation from 1960 through to 2010 about how space debris has increased. Um, so one of the things that has been um, talked about quite a bit is the Kessler syndrome. So I apologise for you, for those of you here who know about the Kessler syndrome, but I'm going to explain it for those who don't. So the Kessler syndrome is the idea, it's the tipping point where the cascade effect of how we have so much space debris the cascade effect from that means that lower Earth orbits, or low Earth orbit, will be unusable, which will then effectively make higher geostationary orbit actually more difficult to use because we have to get through that space jump to actually get up higher. It means not only difficulty with our um, satellites for uh, communication, for financial markets, for food distribution, it obviously has a massive impact on um, the Air Force and, and the Defence's ability to um, run operations and also on our whole concept of fifth generation Air Force, which is very highly dependent on satellites. But it also affects things like our ability to go to Mars and go to the Moon and explore. It has a huge impact. I don't know if you've seen the movie um, Gravity by Sandra Bullock. That's kind of based on this kind of concept. So let's just clean it up, shall we? Well, there's problems associated with that. Firstly, it's really expensive to get up into um, this area. It's expensive to launch up there. So it's a hugely expensive undertaking. Secondly, the problem is it's not junk. When you think of space debris and space junk, you think of the big garbage junk, garbage um, patch in the middle of the um, Pacific Ocean with all the plastic that's all joined up. It's not like that. It's not been abandoned. It is still the property of the state that launched it. So legally, it's not like a bottle that you throw into the ocean off a ship and anybody can pick it up. If I threw a bottle out of the International Space Station and I was from Australia, Australia would own that bottle and have the responsibility of that bottle for the whole time that it, may, that it maintained its place in orbit. So there's a huge problem, a legal problem, around clearing up space junk. The second thing is that much of the space junk, some of it's paint flecks, some of it's bits of dead satellites, some of it's proprietary technology that those states actually don't want messed with. The third thing, the other thing is, is it space junk? There's a researcher in Adelaide called Alice Gorman who actually says that it's not actually junk, all junk, some of it is a part of our space history and we actually need to look after it. She's actually a space archaeologist, which is a really cool title. <laughs> Some of it might be dormant satellites that have been put up there to sleep for a certain number of years, okay? And if we go up there and start cleaning it up as junk, what happens if the country who has put it up there as a sleeper satellite then finds out that we've destroyed it? This could cause huge international incidents. But the biggest problem, um, and I don't know if you've seen this, this is the net that they just recently tested. Um, they sent up a satellite, a few days later they set up um, another satellite that actually released this net, caught the original satellite CubeSat and actually brought it down. So there is a fair amount of research at the moment being done, most of it being done by um, startups, but also by big companies like Boeing, Airbus, Lockheed Martin and so on in order to get rid of space debris. But as I said, anything that can be used to clean up space debris can also be used as an offensive weapon against a working satellite. And one of the concerns is we need a system in place where we can actually go and remove the space debris without causing World War III. We need transparency, we need countries to be, states to be talking to each other, because they've been so good at this up until now. But it's even more important at this point. Because otherwise, when we've got country, countries, um, people like um, Donald Trump saying that any attack on my satellite is a, um, an, attack, a, an attack on my sovereignty and an attack on my state, that can cause huge problems. Okay, so space terrorism. So um, this is a lot of my research is around space terrorism. So given the asymmetrical nature of the war, wars, I should say, that Australia has been fighting for the last 15 years. 
I'm really saddened to say that the vast majority of our space security discussion and policy is revolving around symmetrical warfare. It's like we've forgotten what we've been doing for the last 15 years and we've underestimated the opportunity of what um, some of these rogue states and, and non-state groups are capable of. So we have two main concerns, this is the area that Stephen and I have been researching. Two main, two main groups that we're concerned about. One is rogue states, such as North Korea, who actually do have the capacity to put things into space and actually um, take part in space terrorism. And the second is non-state groups. Um, so we know currently that they're investing heavily in education. We know that they've done this to improve their bomb making. We know that they've done this for their drones. And we know that they're also investing heavily into space education as well. And so it's really only a matter of time until they actually, so we can see them looking at um, disrupting our use of space. And part of the reason this is attractive to them is because it pushes us back to the 1950s or even earlier. Um, it pushes, uh, because we don't have the systems that we had, the robust systems that we had around in the 1950s. So it would affect society dramatically, but it would particularly affect the fifth generation Air Force. Um, so the two main, uh, I'm not going to give you a how-to, but the, just trust me when I say we've done a lot of research into areas in which um, non-state groups could um, cost-effectively look at um, disrupting space operations through either deliberate targeting of civilian satellites or through um, affecting military satellites. And the two main concerns we came up with, one was um, the use of EMPs, which is uh, limited in its effectiveness, but our bigger concern a much, much bigger concern is the deliberate creation of space debris fields by non-state groups. So, for example, uh, putting gravel into space or sending satellites, swarms of satellites into space that you then blow up to create a debris field that then um, effectively over time creates a Kessel syndrome, which means we can't use lower Earth orbit. These are, one of our, these, are, these are some of the concerns that we have. So, just as an aside, I'd like to leave you with, um, I have a long list of other military concerns and ethical issues around space, but I'd like to leave you with two. Um, two that we've kind of been starting to work on. Um, two questions that uh, show that it's not just around terrorism, it's not just around space security, but bigger um, military, ethical, military ethics issues in relation to space. So the two are, um, should private companies, so for example SpaceX, be allowed to have private security firms protecting and policing their space-based assets on orbit? So what is the role of industry in that situation and also in, that, in, in, also in regards to space warfare? Um, one of the concerns we have is we don't want a blackwater situation in space. And the other question I had, which is bigger than just fifth generation Air Force and maybe longer term, is if a manned mission is sent to Mars, and there's a lot of discussion around sending missions to Mars, um, we could send missions to Mars now. People would all die of radiation poisoning and cancer really, really soon after they got there. But the technology to send people to Mars is actually really, really close. What we don't have is the technology to protect them on the way there and while they're there. Um, but so anyway, if a manned mission was sent to Mars, who will have sovereignty over the planet? Will it be the country that gets there first? Um, and who will arbitrate disputes between countries who regard off-Earth colonies and off-Earth mining and resource collection? So what happens if we have two, two states or two companies arguing over the same resource on the same asteroid? Who is going to actually manage that conflict? Is that going to be the UN? Is it going to be Space Force? Is it going to be some sort of policing? Um, it's an interesting dynamic that we actually need to wrestle with now rather than later on. And so those are some of the other ethical issues that I'll leave with you now. And if you have any other ethical issues, I'm happy for you to come and ask me later on. So any questions?